Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, USA, and it's time for Light Talk. Good morning. This is Ellen in Tropical St. Bart, and today we have a very special guest on Light Talk. Welcome, everyone, to episode 259. Well, David is still in Helsinki. It looks not like true. daylight sa- is not true. Is he back? He's in the plane. He's, He's in a- midair well, over the Atlantic right now. He's been texting me. Well, good for him. He's <laughs> flying into our semi-permanent daylight savings time. You know, if Congress has their way, That's and right. Mr. Biden signs off on it. And today we have the original international man of mystery Ooh. phoning in all the way from Dubai. Ellen, let's bring our guest on down. Dubai. Great, great, great. Kurt Vermeulen, founder and principal designer of ACT Lighting Design, is a Belgium-based lighting and visual designer who creates lighting, set, video, and content design for public experiences worldwide. Since 1995, his work has broadened from entertainment and architectural lighting design for retail projects, city master plans, heritage sites, and exhibitions to experience and immersive environments. Kurt's ongoing collaboration with Balich Wonder Studio has solidified his position as a world-class lighting designer for large-scale events and special projects, including the recent 89th Saudi Arabia National Day celebrations and the illustrious visual sonography for the iconic Tree of Life installation at Expo 2015 in Milan. In addition, Kurt has worked together with Puy de Fou for more than eight years, from lighting the Cine Saini in France to the brand new El Sueno de Toledo super production in Spain. Other distinguished projects include the multimedia installation at the National Airport in Brussels, the lighting for the Erasmus Bridge in Rotterdam, and the immersive installation IMX inside Zeleno Park in Moscow. He also recently designed the opening and closing ceremonies for the first Youth Olympic Games in Singapore and the Star in Motion art installation at the top of the Kingdom Tower in Saudi Arabia for the Noor Art Festival in 2021, for which he received four awards so far and one Guinness Book World Record, the only lighting design company who has that on their resume. So, Kurt, wow. welcome to Light Talk. How are things in Dubai? What time is it? It is 7.25 at the moment, p.m. So it's dark yeah. also, darker tide already, yeah. So the lights are on, Kurt. The lights are on. The lights are always on in Dubai, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> were, were, you, were you working today? Are you completely exhausted and hungry now? <laughs> uh, well, I'm trying to take a couple of days off uh, because I just came from Saudi and in Alula, we did a, a very nice concert with a, with a, an Italian composer and pianist called uh, Dardas. But I don't know if you know Alula. It's that archeo- archaeological site with, you know, amazing mm-hmm. rocks and, 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 you know, oh. amazing scenery. And so we were able to use actually that, uh, that scenery to in, into the concert itself. It's a, uh, Beautiful. I'll show you some pictures uh, a little bit later. Love yes. it. Love, love that kind of site-specific stuff. Yeah, lighting the nature. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, I mean, it's it's been a thing of me throughout the years. From from very early on, I was the one that they called if there was something special to light outdoors, and so that's my bread and butter almost, if I can say that. How did how did that happen? Was that did that just was fall into your lap, or was that just a natural evolution, or something you were attracted to? Or? Well, um, I I'm kind of jealous, so I just want to know. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think it's more purpose driven. It was my two colleagues in Belgium that were also lighting designers. Uh, one of them was really into concerts. The other ones was really into TV markets, and so I didn't want to interfere with that. So. I, I mm. kind of grabbed what was left. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> not a bad shot, not a bad leftover. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that, you know, that drove me from, you know, from the events uh, and also a lot of the uh, techno scene or what we call the house scene that we called in that day mm. uh, through architectural lighting and from architectural lighting, we went to do this kind, kind of, you know, big outdoor events and, um, and going strong from there. <laughs> so... Can you talk a little about your evolution 
of being a lighting designer? Where did you start and what's happened over the career? Okay. Uh, well, the, um, I, 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 me personally, I started when I was about 14 years old. Uh, I was, you know, I was already working a little bit with two friends of mine who were older and they had this kind of like a, you know, disco uh, club kind of thing going on and they needed someone, you know, to take care of the lighting. And so, so I did that and that's how I really rolled into it until they were um, taken away from that thing because their parents thought that they were going to the wrong direction. And so I took over that little business <laughs> and, and started from there. So when I was 18, I was, you know, practically having a, um, a small business going on with four, four of my friends. And we were doing fashion shows and little concerts and, and doing the, the first house raids and stuff going on. Whatever, whatever we could our hands on, we were doing it. And that evolved into my first real business, which was a rental firm uh, for lighting and sound, mm. uh, which a lot of people that, you know, come into lighting design actually actually come from. Um, and doing that for five years, I sold my shares to the company, to my two colleagues, and I started the first incarnation of uh, ACT uh, lighting design, uh, which we, I called it art concept technology so that's what the act actually stands for <laughs> okay i was going to ask what that was great art concept uh, technology great and uh that was 1995 and so the first five years i was mostly doing a lot of work alone into these kind of events and outdoor uh, spectaculars and stuff like that but around 99 um the architectural work started to get an appearance mm. because people saw how I was doing lighting for those special events and they thought, oh, maybe we can do this permanently. And so I got asked to, to do, you know, work on, on the church of this and the cathedral of that and, and so on. So the architectural side started to get a, an interesting byproduct of the, of the lighting design itself, but for which I really felt that I needed um, a partner. And so Bruno, the master came into my life and he's still with me today. So that's 27 years that we are, I uh, know, 22 then, uh, that we are still working together. And he's still head of the heritage uh, department in, in what is now a 22 um, people uh, business uh, that we have Mm. in which we have 12, 13, 14 designers, uh, two partners, and going from, you know, marketing, sales, you know, all those kind of things together. So for, for European norms, we are quite a big company. <laughs> in the meantime, I know mm. what I'm talking about. Every month I have to pay uh, <laughs> you know, the bills, so I know what it's, well, what it's like to go there. Um, but, you know, over those 25 years, you know, starting really in the events and, uh, you know, big one-offs through architecture. Um, I think around 2005, after 10 years, I, I did the lighting for uh, Franco Dragon's uh, Le Rêve in, uh, in Vegas. So I was the original designer of that, and that really put me on the map in, internationally. So that mm. was a big step. Um, video design already came into place at that moment. So we, I started to, you know, put video design also into my toolbox. Um, 2010, the, uh, the first Olympics that I did uh, at the Youth Olympics in, in Singapore, um, where I was the full visual designer of, of, of the show. So video, lighting, special effects, water, fireworks, everything was a little bit under my supervision uh, let's call it and i like that so i i built on that further so today lighting is still our main focus of the company i don't think we'll do a project without lighting <laughs> or lighting design mm -hmm. uh, but we are um, interestingly taking care of all the visual aspects and, and water or the aquatic effects are a big a big mm -hmm. thing for us today I mean, that's thanks to Franco because he introduced me to water <laughs> in the first show and <laughs> I was able to, you know, cook up a lot of stuff and, and try out a lot of stuff uh, for, for that show and that kind of, you know, hooked me on, on water and how to light water in a way. Alan did a magnificent article on that that appeared on LDI, on, on the Lighting Dimensions uh, magazine still then. I think it was Lighting Dimensions still called it that way. It probably was. Yeah. 
So then just to round it off from, uh, you know, that whole visual design element taking control, uh, I think the pinnacle was then in 2015, the expo where, you know, the Eiffel Tower of Milan, the Tree of Life became my, um, my thing. I was uh, the one creating all the visuals and uh, like the, the metteur en scène, like we say in French, you know, the, the, art, the, art, the art director for that kind of thing. And since then we have been ju just going forward with that and, and taking on um, also sometimes the engagement parts of the, um, with the public. So reactivity, interactivity, those kind of things are also part of our, you know, our scope of works that we do. That's impressive. Um, uh, really impressive. I've got the next question, but before I ask my question about the Olympics, you got big, 22 people. Did you, was that sort of surprising to you that that growth happened and do you like it or did you, did you, you know, yeah, you're paying the bills and now you've got, you're responsible for other people's mortgages and such. Do you enjoy having that size firm or how do you feel about that? And then I'll ask my other question. Yeah. Well, um, in we have this uh, saying it's a uh, the the sword cuts on two sides you know um <laughs> yeah. i love it Double to have sword. a team of people um because i think uh, the creativity and everything that comes with it is much higher much better once you are in a small mm. team uh i'm not saying mm. you have to do brainstorms with five or six people in the room because frankly it doesn't work but two or three people together you can build on each other mm. and you can actually bring it up towards something which is always more than what you could have done alone or yourself uh, so that's certainly one thing and i kind of learned early that i like to share i like to you know involve people and learn from other people also in this kind of job so so those are the two good things that you have <laughs> by having a you know company like this. Um, yeah. The fact that we have you know those kind of departments, the architectural side and the art installations, and then the pure entertainment part, you know, it's also the reason why we have so many people uh, in the firm because you know mm. uh, it's a dedicated team that you need for these kind of projects, and so that you know that that works in a kind of way that I feel that um, it, it's helping the, the company grow. It grew organically, like one person every six months or every year. Uh, sometimes we went back a few, then we went back over it. So it's uh, the market also decides a little bit for you. You know, you want to do this job, mm. well, you need these kind of people here. Thank you for that. That's really cool to hear. How were you involved in the recent Olympic closing ceremonies? Tell us about that. Yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we were, we were, I was only involved in the closing ceremony because the, the next uh, Winter Olympics will happen in, in Italy, uh, in Milano Cortina, which are two cities, uh, two regions actually in, in the north of Italy that will host the next Winter Olympics and for which there was always a section in the um, in the closing ceremony which he called the flag handover, which you know twenty years mm -hmm. ago was just you know they put the flag, give gave it to the next mayor, and that's it. But in the meantime, the you know the visiting country now gets a segment, seven eight minutes, in which they can actually show. Um, a little bit of what they want to show and, and invite people in a way over to come and see in four years and then the next the next uh, Winter Olympics. Mm. So that segment was ours, and because I worked with with Balic uh, Wonder Studio um, on, on on this kind of project, and uh, you know Marco Balic and me, we are you know we we are a good fit together artistically. We we kind of like each other. I like what he does. He kind of likes what I do. What I do so. We are working closely together in, in, in the last couple of years. And this, um, this flag handover was very important for him. Um, as of course he wants, we, we, we want all of us to become, you know, the production company for the opening and closing ceremony in 2026, of course. Um, but it was quite a challenge to work under the circumstances that was the Beijing uh, Winter Olympics, because that's a whole story. Um, 
And I think that's also why I think it's let's, let's yeah, hear that's, it. let's that's hear a good it. thing to tell. <laughs> well, most of you have heard that we had all these bubbles and, you know, you can't touch this and you can't be in, you know, in relationship with Chinese people that are outside of your, your thing. So it, it all started already when we, we came on board in the airplane uh, and it's a direct charter flight that goes from, in this case, from Milano straight to uh, to Beijing um, is where even already all the, uh, you know, the, the people helping on board are completely like we are Chernobyl. You know, uh, they're completely oh, wow. with the white wow. things, uh, um, diver helmet, uh, mask in front of us, double mask with the filters extra, uh, tape around, mm. tape around the wrists and the, and the ankles, really in a way that you, you think you are, you know, wow. you're the, you know, you're number one in the Ebola virus uh, camp here. So that's how wow. they. For our, for our listeners at home right now, <laughs> Kurt is standing there dressing himself. He's waving his hands in the air. Oh, yeah. He's wrapping <laughs> gaffer's tape around his hands. He's putting his helmet on. I'm sorry you're missing this because it, it is it is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I got that from the Italians in the meantime. That I'm, you know, when I talk, I use the hands now. <laughs> it helps to convince people. I assure you. The sure. more you do, animated, yeah, yeah, yeah. the more you do with yeah. your hands, the more you grab them and you put them into your own uh, storytelling. It's the passion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where was I? Yeah. So in the plane, you know, you get a bag of food, you know, in a plastic bag and, you know, three waters and <laughs> some, some beef jerky and those kind of things for which you have to do the 10 hour <laughs> flight. If you want to go to the toilet, you need to ring the bell and you can only be one person at one time going to the toilet. That's, you know, it was a whole, you know, thing. Arriving, uh, we, we had to do two PCR tests, one 48 hours before we left and one 24 hours before we left. Uh, mm -hmm. On arrival, a special gate, a special area just for us. Um, nothing mm. is in there. It's completely empty. There is no stores open. There's you can't. There's no vending machines. Nothing. So PCR test again. Uh, measurements. Uh, lots of stuff. Finally, you get into a bus. The bus is closed. The chauffeur is also completely wrapped up and completely sealed off from wow. us yeah, with a with plexi. Wow. And they bring us to the hotel. <laughs> and the hotel is fenced. You know, with, you know, with some police, some military people just watching an eye. I mean, they're not there with their, with their guns, eh? but they are, they are looking out for us. So let's call it this way. So you can be in your mm -hmm. hotel there. You can be free every day, a PCR test every day. Um, and then you are taken back into the bus to the stadium. And there is then, you know, what they call the area, um, zero which is for us and the other area which is then for the the, the chinese team that we cannot interact with mm. and so there is literally mm. a glass wall between us and them and there is no way of communicating not seeing them um they are on other levels in the stadium so we, we can't interact with them i couldn't even you know like they do in the in the films where you can touch each other through the glass you can at least communicate verbally or something that wasn't even possible this is a team that's helping you mount your show. Well, that, that, you can't that was a challenge we had to, you know, look into it. And we knew from the start that this was going to be, you know, it was written down in a, in a paragraph of like six sentences that this would be. But you cannot imagine it until you're actually there and you're, you're in front of this, mm. you know, beast that you, you know, have to try to caress and see what you can get out of it. So mm. it became mm. what I call lighting design by WeChat. You know, WeChat is like WhatsApp uh, <laughs> that we have, but then for the okay. Chinese version. And and that's wow. what it became because um, in the beginning I made, you know, this huge queue list in which for every queue we are, I, I described what I wanted for each mm. apology, what I need to be done, the backlight needs to do this and this color and so on. Everything was translated to Chinese and I sent those documents to them and it came back mm. with more questions than ever <laughs> so we <laughs> so we also did visualizations so we we took with mm. us our our own console and and the setup of the whole setup uh we used uh, depends um depends too as the visualization mm. suite uh because it was the only one really giving us the right quality and 
3,000 fixtures. Moving heads is quite a lot to visualize in any <laughs> quite yeah, a lot. in any visualization yeah. suite. But depends was the one who was the most reactive, and that's why we, we kind of went with it. With it. Um, so for each queue, we also made a you know uh, a photo, a render that we said this is how mm. it has to look like. That all was sent to them. But then, you know, communication came back once a day through one email with questions and stuff like that. Until through somebody and somebody else, I found the WeChat number of one of the four operators that was in the tech room, in the console room, uh, and who spoke uh, English. <laughs> mm. And then finally, I was able to communicate with him through what we chat and, and, you know, during rehearsals, I was sitting out in the cold because it was really cold. It was minus four, minus eight in the stadium. And uh, mm. so we were just you know, looking at rehearsals and we only had programming time during rehearsals with them. They wouldn't do anything else because they were programming the rest of the show, of course. So I was like, we chatting like, like this. I've got like, wow. an, you know, an enormous list of things, sending out extra visuals, you know, scri scribbling on my iPhone and sending it to them and that this kind of way. And so step by step over five days, I was able to, you know, get to the final result of, of, of our segments. And, um, uh, um, I was also very lucky that those Chinese operators were actually very, very good. They were, you know, they knew their consoles. Uh, when I described something or I show something, they copied it like, like really, really, really good. So if, um, if, I mean, if that was not the case, I don't think I was, I would have been proud of what we have done there because those guys really showed off, uh, a lot of operators that I know that they are, you know, they say they can do all the stuff, but they don't. So. <laughs> I just have to say, you, you're totally blowing out my image of how glamorous I thought the work would be. That doesn't sound glamorous at all <laughs> in terms of the process, you know, but you got, but you were able to pull out the result, but it was, sounds like in some ways, guerrilla lighting to kind of that much translation going on. Yeah, guerrilla communication. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and luckily they were, you know, capable of, you know, keeping up and, and you know, also just, uh, I'm a perfectionist. I, I like to do stuff, you know, very precise. Um, mm. And so. Did you have to adjust your expectations I, on this one well, a little uh, bit? Not in terms of the things that I could get from them, but the things I, there were yeah. also a couple of things I couldn't get from them. Um, and one of them right. was um, uh, the, the the real, you know, the handover of the flag itself. I wanted to create within the within the, the, the arena, within the, within the stadium, the, the the flags, the colors of of, of the Italian flag, uh, in which I literally took the arena, split it up in three parts: one green, one white, and one red. And so all the lights split up in those things should be red, just mm. pointing down and pointing up with 3,000 fixtures. Yeah, we have more than enough to do. <laughs> it, it just bounces everywhere, <laughs> so it doesn't mind. That I never got from them. And it was, mm. I think, I mean, they never said it with those words, but every day I asked, oh, when I, can I see that queue? And they said, oh, you know, it's difficult. We don't know mm. yet. So after the four days, I just asked them, I won't get it, will I? Question mark. <laughs> and then they uh, said, "You know, I have, I have, I have one follow up. Did, did you find that the present giving them the visualization images helped? Like, would it enormous. have been as good enormous. as you got without no, no. it? Enormous, they, enormous. Yeah, because I can literally take one of my visuals that we did and hold it against the photograph of the other one and." It's, you know, I mean, the, it's, yeah, it's the angle of the camera is not the same, but when you look at the backlight, you look at the, at, at the lighting of the stage, the lighting of the, yeah. of the audience that's behind it, it is almost exactly the same. Yeah, Beautiful. that was, that was, Beautiful. that was cool. I remember see. the days when we didn't have, when we didn't have that stuff, you had to draw it. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do you think the flag was like, the flag was politically motivated that they didn't want to do it? Yeah, I can't. Um, Confirm this, of course, and I won't. I don't want to burn any bridges here. But I, I understood, um, you know, implicitly that that, that was that, that was cancelled. Yeah. Resistance. 
There was resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a, only our flag. But you're working in a political environment at the Olympics, a globally political I, environment. Yeah. And, and I learned later on that there was actually a political man sitting in the control room, uh, you know, making it's, sure it's China, that yes. nothing went wrong. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, um, it's not the first job that I do is in, in China. I've done six or seven jobs there, um, most of them more mm. permanent things. Um, this one is a special. Um, most of the others, there is a very, you know, hierarchy. And, you know, when you do a presentation to them and, you know, the first seven people that start to talk are actually just, you know, hierarchy wise, you go up. It's only whatever says the last guy is what is important. You know, all the rest doesn't matter. Uh, that's that I know mm. the way it works there. But I mean, this one was, you know, was special. I, and I was lucky at the end that I was able to sit down with the shaders in the OBS um, control room. And mm. I could, you know, I was with them so I could warn them about where the lighting would be like this and like that. So they could, you know, tweak the cameras to what I, I needed. And I must say that was also very, very helpful that I was, that they allowed me to be in the control room with them and for my segment to, you know, <laughs> to play with that and say, you know, here yeah, the it's... content is like this and that content is like that. So take it down. This must be up, uh, open up here, you know, uh, and go down there. That mm. was also very helpful to be there. So let's talk about LEDs. You know, are, are you completely sold on LEDs? Is that what you do? you know, in total now, um, maybe you could talk about some of the challenges that that new equipment is, uh, posing for you. Yeah. Um, I can, uh, I have to split it up, um, in depends on what segment of the, you know, the work that we are working on is, is, is important. If I, if we do architectural projects today, you cannot go without any LEDs anymore. It's impossible uh, because, yeah. it, you know, right. you, you've got all the, the legislation that comes around, the phasing out of all the bulbs that you're doing. So no way of doing an architectural project that needs to be there for five to 10 years and not use LEDs today. You know, that's uh, an impossible thing. Um, the white light that comes out of the LEDs of the, you know, the proper uh, LED manufacturers for me is is more than I mean, even better than what fluorescent used to be. So I'm I'm quite happy by using full LED in most of our architectural projects. Um, we you know even for retail, even for um, consumer goods, uh, supermarkets, and everything, we have done most of the projects in the last five years with full LED. Sometimes with a mixed result, you know, sometimes, you know, some, some of the LEDs were not the way we thought that they were going to be. Um, but, but for the quality that it was supposed to represent, and especially in comparison with um, CDM or HID or uh, the fluorescent lights, I think we, we, we went better. You know, I, you know, at home, I still have incandescent bulbs and I bought a bunch of them so I can go out of my life with them, but, uh, but that's, um, <laughs> but that's also because the, the fixtures for which they were they're done, you know, some floss, uh, you know, design fixtures that, you know, you, you I need to put those in, uh, you can't put a LED bulb in there because, uh, you know, it was conceived in the fifties and the sixties or whatever. So you can't, you know, I can't conceive it with, with some, something else than that. Um, so I thought you have a nice collection at home of, of classic lamps. I've, I've got a few. Yeah. 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 Actually my, my, the main thing that I'm really into is champagne actually. So I'm a champagne collector, yeah. but also a drinker. So I, I, I drink what I collect. Yeah. <laughs> that's my, <laughs> that's a, you know, I had a business question that came up when you were talking about the, uh, the Olympics, who is the client? Like who, 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 who do you contract with when you're doing something of that scale and, and do they pay you on time? That's kind of a tongue in cheek Ooh, question, okay. you know, <laughs> well, um, <laughs> right. But who's, who, who do you, who are you working for when you're working on something of that size? Yeah. Well, usually for the, for one of the producers, um, especially okay. for now for the Olympics, uh, the winter Olympics here, I was working for Balich. Balich is, is, is contracting me oh, for Balich. and Balich is being paid yeah. by the Italian organizing uh, Olympic Committee. 
Com- the yeah. committee is, the, is, the, is the ultimately Italian, the client. The Italian yeah. Olympic Committee, because they're already right. in place because they have to do Cortina in uh, and Milano Cortina in, right. in four years. When I was doing uh, JOG, Youth Olympic Games, it was direct for the Olympic, uh, the, uh, the, the Singapore Youth Olympic Committee. And mm. always nicely paid. Singapore is... <laughs> Well, Singapore, no I, would that. That. <laughs> I was wondering if, if it was a slow, if it was a slow pay coming out of China, I just out of curiosity. Okay. No, not in this case, it, no. no, and Bali is a good yeah, yeah, okay. pace, pace, you know, normal. Yeah. Right. Most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> no. um, Go ahead, going back to those LEDs. Um, if I look at the other scope, uh, which is maybe, you know, in one word, entertainment or art installations, then I'm, I'm, I'm open. And I, I really feel that hmm. whatever f- gives me the right, uh, you know, look and feel or visual that I'm looking for will be my, my instrument of choice. Um, <clears throat> in the last couple of productions in the last couple of years, we've still been using, you know, the, you know, a Sharpie and, and a Mythos and those kind of things, which have, uh, hmm. you know, the HID sources or the, you know, MHD, whatever it is today. Um, discharge sources. So I, you know, I grew up with those. I, I love them. I, I, I get everything out of them, what I, what I want. Not doing TV myself, unless for those kind of big moments, I am less prone to going into that kind of, yeah, you know, there's a little mild shift to the green or whatever in that lamp. So I don't mm. like it. <laughs> I mean, most of my stuff is, is, you know, big stuff outdoors and we're already happy that, that we have a light source that actually goes and does the job and stays on mm. during the rain and the fall and the snow and whatever that we have, mm. that, that we are encountering. So that little mirror shift that comes in, well, you know. <laughs> it's inconsequential at your scale, at that scale, yeah, right? so, yeah. Yeah. And frankly, um, I, lo- looking at the Pretty Fou is a, is a theme park in France that has won a lot of awards. Uh, TA awards and the APA awards and whatever as the best team park in the world, uh, the last couple of things. They have a show that is already running for 48 years, which is the Cine Cine. That's how we pronounce it, Ellen. Mm. The Cine Cine. Sorry. <laughs> Cine Cine. Yeah, you were very close. But, and so it's. I have to go. And, yeah. Yeah, maybe you can redo it, but let's see. Cine Cine. Cine Cine. So it's cine from cinema. Cine, cine. And now cine I got it. And from cine scenic. from cine. Wait. Yeah, so, so it's a, a scenic cinema. That's basically cine, cine. What, what you're doing. So, cine, cine. Yeah. So for Pretty Fool on the, um, for the Cine Cine show, which is, I think, literally from, from my knowledge, the biggest show on earth, uh, permanent. Uh, in a way, because they have literally 3,700 actors on stage at, at, at the finale. There are uh, 70,420 people looking at this uh, enormous stage, which is 240 meters wide. So it's about 700 feet or something. Uh, it's 110 <laughs> meters deep, so close to 350, the 350 feet deep. Um, and a lot of it is water and you've got all those actors and, you know, the whole, the whole thing is, is, uh, you know, you got 500 people backstage and, and, and people in the technical part doing all this kind of thing. Uh, they are, um, <clears throat> that, that kind of thing where they don't want to see the actor's faces, for instance. It's one of the things that we uh, had to, you know, they want to see them, but they want to recognize them. So we are at liberty to do stuff, lighting people in uh, pale green, you know, or lighting them in very saturated colors, because the idea of the lighting is to follow the narrative and the storytelling. And so we came up with a, an idea for if we are in a dream world, this is the color. If we are in the war, this is the color. If we are in a happy place, mm. this is the color. And so we're lighting people mm. in those shades without making sure that we, we don't see the people's recognizable faces like you would a superstar or you know, a band or whatever. It is because those people all have alternatives. Uh, you, you know, the, the guy who plays the prince, well, there are five princes, you know, and so they, they do a role 
uh, uh, over the weeks that they are playing. And so they, they want the character to be a character. They don't want the character to be a person. And so that kind of lighting is also very interesting. And you can commit to being very low in your CRI or everything because it's all about, you know, the color narrative that we have put in place. Interesting. Yeah, and I guess that works. I just, I'm thinking about the scale that you're describing. And so it becomes more about, it's almost iconography rather yeah. than and the story and, and, and individual sort of nuance. Nuance is sort of out the window in a way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there is not a moment. Yeah, I mean, we've got one moment in the show, there's one person walking by and it takes 15 minutes almost. No, that, that's a lot. It takes just six minutes and a half for him to, to cross the stage. Uh, that, that's how it starts. And, and then once in a while we have, but most of the time it's always filled with like 300 people and 200 there. And so, so that people are looking at all those things together. And that's why the special effects and the water and the lasers and the video projections and everything all become also such an important part of the storytelling. Um, and you said the audience is 70,000. The audience 17, is 70,000. 17. Yes. Okay. All, all okay. sitting down on a, on a bleacher uh, that, that goes almost 28 meters high at, at the end, I think, from the, from the level down. It's quite impressive. How long does that show, how long does that show run? It's about it's, hour, I know, it's, almost, hours? it's 106 minutes. Uh, 106 it used to be 117, minutes. and over the years, we kind of took it down already a bit. Hmm. Yeah, and people sit outside, you know. Uh, when it's raining, it's raining. The show goes... I think over the 47 yeah. years that they have been running this show, I mean, in the beginning, it was not like this. It, it, it started as this, sure. you know, mom and pop shop kind of thingy with, you know, a couple of, you know, a couple of bleachers and, you know, two horses and something. But in the meantime, it's, it's really become this mega production and it runs from June wow. to, to September. So that's the, that's the season. That, it's on it's on my bucket list now. Oh, you should, you should. <laughs> it's you should. Definitely on my list. But I, yeah. I would I would then say to you, um, the food then opened in the last two three years a new uh, theme park in Spain in Toledo, and it also started with also a mega show outside. But there the it's a bit smaller in in size, but they went for professional actors. So we have three hundred and fifty people mm. uh, on stage with the horses and everything. And, but those are professionals. And so focus is different. The choreographies are much more elaborate. Costumes are more elaborate. Um, it's less uh, figurative. Uh, it's also really about acting. And I would suggest that you first go and see uh, Spain, see how that works, and then go to, to France and see the, the, the mega uh, production. Uh, they're not so far away from each other. I mean, you could, I mean, a good day's drive and you can go from one to the other. I mean, maybe a two. <laughs> maybe two. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> we have to start doing some light talk backstage tours. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. There we oh. go, Ellen. Ellen is always thinking like a marketer. Well, with, with, <laughs> I mean, with the TEA, uh, we have done backstage tours in Pretty Fool and everything. So, right. so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a team entertainment. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's normal right. that they kind of do that. Yeah. You know, we got a really great picture of the challenges that you met in Beijing. Um, have other projects been impacted by the pandemic or the post-pandemic? Um, well, uh, we were fully on programming uh, the new water show for Pretty Fou France when pandemic, you know, started. Uh, and so we switched everything to offline uh, programming. And it was in a time because, you know, the pandemic trust started at the 14th of March or something like that. And we had to open on the 1st of June. And so in that time, it was very, very difficult for us to travel, even just from Belgium to France, which is like a day's, I, I mean, it, with, with a car, it's six or seven hours of driving. It's not that, that, that humongous. But having to cross the borders was impossible. So we kind of, uh, put everything into offline. Um, so we were programming during the day, putting it all in the visualizer, uh, a number, and then we sent the, the, the disc, uh, not by courier, of course, just by, by email to the console operator on site who put it into the, uh, in the console over there, ran the show a couple of times, um, and recorded the artistic director, 
um, Nicolas Debier, who was there. And he was giving all his notes um, during the video recording. He was, you know, talking into it. And so we got the visuals of what we saw, what was working, and all the notes from him. And so the next day, we were working on those notes and programming a bit further. And so we did that for almost three weeks uh, to get to get to the show uh, and get it ready for, for rehearsals. And that, that was, normally we would have gone on site for a week or so and do that, do all that thing on site. But now over three weeks, we were able to, to get to a certain level of, you know, finishing. And, um, we, uh, we then were able to go, uh, actually on site with a special permit and blah, 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 that we had to go through the embassy to get them. And then, you know, uh, Luke and me, we went with the car to Pirifu and stayed for four days for rehearsals to finish the show off. But that was also a little And bit... were they actually open in, tw- in June of 2020? No, no, did they actually no, no, open? No, 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 they, they couldn't. I think they finally opened on the 15th of July or something. Um, on the 14th of July, I think, uh, there was, they, they finally opened. But they wanted to be ready because they said, you know, they were pushing the government also. They, I know they opened a week earlier than actually was allowed. But, you know, they said they opened and they said, if the governor wants to come and shut us down, you should go. <laughs> right. This is a conversation for another day. But this whole thing about, you know, staying at home and programming via mm. uh, whatever you were programming by long distance is really probably a way of the future. It is. Uh, people are going to save their carbon carbon footprint and cut down on, you know, costs and flying. And, you know, you go at the end, but you could probably do a whole lot of the previs and the other programming from afar. Yeah, I, I think we were already doing that a lot. Uh, I mean, designing already in 3D with those kind of programs. We were doing that to make sure that positions, because, you know, we're not in a straightforward theater where, you know, you got your Alex right. bars, whatever. Oh, yeah. we always have, you know, strange places and stuff. So we are, you know, we, we send out a drone, we, 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 we map out the, uh, the architecture or the landscaping, we put that into a program so we know actually where we can put our stuff, yes or no. But going so far is, you know, that we are finishing almost the show. But I can also say from my point of view that we are capable with the tools that we have today is to have maybe 70% of the show ready. The other 30, I don't feel comfortable not going on site and just saying, listen, here's the 70%. It will work. It will work. Of course, it will work. But I, I wouldn't put my name underneath that. That's I, I would. I, I, I still need the on-site thing. Is still very necessary. How does the customer really react to the lighting that you think you you put? Even if you put the you know the the GPA of the costume on on the model that you put in your 3D program, you know you don't have all those things. And uh, what about the happy coincidences? You know, all that stuff that you do in reality, there's a lot of, you know, what I call the happy coincidence, things you never thought of that would, that could happen. Right. And those things are, like, wow, you know, you're like, Jesus. And you want to put that in your show. Right. Serendipity is, has a value. But at the same time, do you, if you if you got 70 percent of it out through the visualization, then you have more time yeah. for those happy exactly. accidents or, or experimentation when you're on the site. So there's a, I think there's a, would you agree there's a net gain? No, for sure. That, and also way. cost, cost wise, you know, we heard, we, we, I mean, sure. being right. on site with the whole kids five days longer, uh, needing to go and do the whole thing, uh, you know, with, with rehearsals, with, with technicians on site, that's a cost. That's a real cost. And we can definitely take that out. In, in Alula, we had two days where we had sandstorms, so we couldn't go on site. Luckily, we did all mm. the things beforehand. And I was able in one night to actually see the whole show, except for the finale number, and do all the notes and all the things and all the tweaks and stuff in one night, where normally we should have needed three nights to really do that if we weren't right, prepared for right. it. I- I've been a big fan of visualization since 2000. So I think it's been a tool that's, you know, I was a fan when people said, nah, I will never use that. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, 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 I bought WIG version one or version 1.5. Me too. No, 3.5. You were ahead of me. I was in a 3.0. I think I, think. I, I, I already cashed out then because I felt that they were 
every time asking three thousand dollars or four thousand every big version i said yeah i won't say the word but yeah i'm doing it by hand so. yeah there was a little bit right well we we but we spent five thousand here at the school for the the, the learning version yeah. which was a lifetime oh so i got good. that still yeah. so it's 23 no, years I felt, and they, I they, they were for me. exaggerating every time doing again like it's a new version yeah if it was like autodesk where you yeah. have three four three to five hundred dollars a year Okay, you know right. that's that's a good well, good number, but five thousand every time, you know, every two three years. No, that's too much. That was too much. I think it took me about seven years to get Gil to do an educational version for students, which now mm. we have. Yeah, you know, so that's that's really helped, and I still teach it, you know, along with other things. But but I think just visualization in general gave us a way to communicate and a way to be more efficient than we've ever had before. Can I, so can I give a tip uh, something? Because, because yeah, please do. Because please. We use wig and depends uh, at the same time. And frankly, the, the render and output, and, and of course you got that, the, the, all the water stuff also with depends, which you, you, I mean, which is not really good yeah. in wig. But we use both of them at the same time. And we actually use with wig for the focus point. Because you know we put okay. just one thing. Black tracks. No, no, just you know in the in the weak environment, uh, we say here focus. Yeah. All the lights go there. It communicates it with the, with the desk. Of course, you can store it as a queue. Right. And so depends use that also because it it gives the the information and it gives you things. So we are much quicker than before. Uh, because you're using by both. using both in a tandem uh, in that kind of way by using the you know the power wow. of the one to enhance the you know the visualization of the other one and that's that's a, that's a good tip i think how much does the pens cost i'll have to look <laughs> at that <laughs> do, do they have an academic yes. version i wonder i, I think they do uh, they do and they are with models um you know so the first model is lighting or water and those are you know reasonably okay i think like two two thousand dollars or so the water model alone is is 10k that's a lot that's that you yeah, yeah that's, that's a lot. you really want to run i appreciate i appreciate that i appreciate that tip so uh, just to be friendly to give you a, a nice tip to reciprocate your <laughs> tip on depends which i'm going to look at take a look at lumion oh we, we, we're using lumion uh, for for our landscaping architectural, architectural architectural stuff yeah yeah we're doing that we're using it for my students are using it for, for theater. theater oh okay and it's yes and it's looking fabulous to get their i just to get the idea out just to get concept okay. out faster than a, and a photoshop or so but do you like it oh i mean the render of lumion is is perfect for landscaping for us you know in architectural things yeah, yeah for sure you know it's uh, yeah. but yeah. you know the moment I think about DMX and and you know cues and but that's something else. The students are using Lumion just to get the idea okay. out of their head to show it to a director or uh, or someone else. Okay, right? They they get the idea very quickly. Okay, understood. Of what the intention is. Okay, understood. This has been great, uh, Steve. You have the last question. Sure. So uh, you've been doing this for a while. We have a lot of young listeners, uh, a lot of students. What advice would you give those people? Or what advice would you give yourself when you were 18? <laughs> get a mentor. Uh, get a mentor. Yeah. I, um, I didn't have that. I, you know, I started my first business at 14, <laughs> went straight into being a an, an business owner at 21, which was the legal age to become a business owner at that time. Uh, so I never had somebody, I never worked for somebody. I was always working with clients, with, with people. Um, and, and I don't want to, you know, be too posh about that, but I know what I can give to my fellow people in the office, how I can mentor them, how we can help them become better designers with my experience. And that's the only thing that I said, I wish I would have had uh, somebody like that, a mm -hmm. mentor in my life at some point and maybe i wouldn't have made all those mistakes in my young years <laughs> and <laughs> because he already would have made them for me and he would have said no 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 don't do this uh, it doesn't work um and i had to find that out all by myself uh, and i would definitely say that you know find a mentor and, and you know do the do the grassroots thing you know start from the bottom learn what gels are uh learn how uh, you know an inconsistent bulb reacts to a dimmer and how that you know is different from led um 
you know, learn what a Fresnel and a PC and what a, what a profile is before you start, you know, pushing buttons on an MA and, and, um, do that, uh, you know, weekly stuff that most of the students who don't go through the grassroots are just seeing moving heads going all around the place. I mean, those basic things are, I think, very important. Uh, even if you only do it for a couple of weeks, but if you, if you learn how to look at lights in that respect, it will make your life so much easier afterwards when you have hundreds of lights in front of you and, and you try to get your head around that. Great stuff. Well, Kurt, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a fantastic interview and I'm going to make all of my students listen to it. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> I'll say it is, and it's really great to reconnect with you. And I know I owe you a few articles on live design, so okay. I'm going to get oh, working yeah, on there those you go. very yeah, soon. Yeah. I'm sorry and some that cover, we didn't cover do it pages. Sooner. Cover pages, it's been too long, Ellen. Uh, well, you know, it, we don't we don't print a magazine anymore. Oh. But you'll have to come to LDI in the fall and do all this live. That would be great. Uh, oh, and a light talk trip to Europe. To, uh, with, with a, our tour guide. Yeah. Kurt. Oh, well, let's, let's do, do it. it. I'm not kidding. Let's, let's do, do it. That, that would be that. great. I'm serious. I'm ready. Yeah. Too. Spain and France. I'm ready. Spain, France, Belgium. Oh, please. Oh, I'll bring you to all Belgium, the good stuff. Belgium, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Bring you to, yeah, you got right? to, now you got to see my studio. I mean, at least, you know, you got to see those 22 people. Absolutely. Working. I'm, I'm telling you, <laughs> be careful what you ask for because I'll oh, take you we, up on we, this. We invite, you know, we, we entertain a lot of people. So, uh, so it's not, not, not an issue. We love it. We would Let just me know when you're there. We're on the love way. It. We're on the way. But... The rocking sounds of the luminoids tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, Amazon Prime Music, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website at lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, in case you were wondering, we do have a European office. So if you decide to litigate, the law firm of Flecht, Flock, Flair and Glare and their paralegal Snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sista. Coming to you from St. Bart's, Gainesville, Florida, Dubai in the UAE and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to join us next week when we celebrate Light Talk's amazing fifth anniversary with special guest Tony Award winner Natasha Katz. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. And once again, we want to thank our good friend Kurt Remulin for joining us today from Dubai. And we'll see you all again on Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.